right friends. Well, do turn with me, please, to Psalm 50. That we read a little earlier. Now, misunderstandings, misunderstandings, they cause all sorts of problems, don't they? Um, on a very simple level, if you misunderstand the directions, what's going to happen? Thank you very much. If you have a conversation with somebody and you misunderstand the conversation, you can get the wrong end of the stick. That can cause all sorts of problems. Sometimes there's no way of sorting that out unless you can talk it through. And sometimes people take the half and even that proves difficult. But on a more serious level, I'm not sure how much more serious this is, but some of you will know. If you misunderstand what your loved one likes and you buy them the wrong flowers on Valentine's Day, well, instead of bringing the joy you'd hoped for, it can bring some annoyance, can't it? And then you feel terrible. Okay. The most serious level, and the level that's been spoken about in Psalm 50, is this. It's possible to misunderstand God. What I mean by that isn't just that it's possible to misunderstand the character of God and who he is, but it's possible to misunderstand what God wants from us and why it matters. And that, of course, is the greatest and the most serious misunderstanding of all. So that's what we get in Psalm 50. We see people who misunderstand God, what God wants from them, and we see God speaking to them to make it clear. So I've got two little questions, store them away in the back of your mind. Number one, do you understand what God wants from you? Number two, are you doing it? Okay, so that's what we've got today from Psalm 50. Start with verses 1 to 6. Judgment. It's quite a striking psalm, really. The picture is a picture of God, who's described as the mighty one, God the Lord. And in verses 1 to 6, he appears in the beauty of holiness to judge in righteousness. If you read through the verses, you'll see um, those phrases and those words jumping out. But the thing to notice here is that this judgment begins at the house of God. He's speaking to his people. And particularly, it's a judgment of mercy. Now, that sounds strange, a judgment of mercy, but it is. The final judgment, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, isn't a judgment of mercy. It's a judgment which is final and unalterable and inevitable and eternal. What we are told in Scripture is that all people who have ever lived will stand body and soul before the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Christ is the judge. We're told that all the books will be opened, the books which record our actions and our words, our thoughts and our intentions. And we are told that the judgment will be in righteousness. That is, the God who knows all things and the God who cannot lie, the God who doesn't make mistakes, will take all the factors and the full context into account and weigh it all up perfectly. And the judgment he will come to will be perfect. And no one will be able to complain that it is in any way unfair. But we're also told that that judgment leads then to a final separation. In Matthew's Gospel, it's described as sheep and goats. But the idea is, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, repentant people who've trusted in Christ and have been washed in the blood of Christ, will find an eternal joy in the presence of the Saviour in heaven. Whereas those who stand before God in their sins will be cast away eternally. Now that's final judgment. It's not something which is particularly pleasant to talk about, but it is an unavoidable truth of Scripture. There is a final judgment which comes, which is as relevant to every one of us as our next breath, because it's something that we're all going to face. But in Psalm 50, what you get is a kind of dry run. It's a judgment for the purposes of mercy. Because the Lord steps in and he speaks to people and he says, you know what, this is the situation the way it is today. Now I'm drawing your attention to this now so that matters can be put right. I want to point out to you what it is that I want from you in your lives, how you should live and how you should relate to me. And I want you to put it into practice in your life by coming to me. That's what I desire. 
So I'm making that plain now so that there might be opportunity for you to come and to find the salvation that you so much need. What he's doing, you see, is he's clearing up misunderstandings. And that's so very, very important. Okay. Verse 5. This judgment, who does it relate to? This is what it says. Um, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. It's a judgment, a dry run, a proclamation on those who claim to be the people of God. Saints who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. In Asaph's day, Asaph wrote the psalm. What we find is that there were many people who claimed that they were the people of God. They'd entered into this great covenant, and God was their God, and they were his people. And you get background to this, for instance, in Exodus 24, where uh, Moses is with the people, and blood is shed. And I'll just read a little bit of it. Moses came, told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. So Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Then he sent young men and offered burnt offerings, sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord, took half the blood, put it in basins, half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, read it in the hearing of the people. They said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Now that's the background in the history of Israel, you see. God called these people to be his people, and in response, they pledged obedience to him at the pain of death. Blood is sprinkled. It's a symbol of death. The blood sacrifices show what sin and disobedience deserve. Now, the Lord comes and he says, right, this is how you see yourself. People who've entered into covenant with me, people who are my people, and you claim that I'm your God. Now, I want to make sure that you understand this, and I want to make sure that you've got it right. You need to know the real implications of this. This isn't something that you want to commit to, and you want to make a mistake. So in verse 4, he calls the whole of creation to bear witness. He calls the heavens above and the earth to come and be witness as he makes this great proclamation and he speaks to the people. Okay. Most of us here this morning would say that we are the people of God, Christians. Great. In Psalm 50, the Lord speaks primarily to us. Okay? Saints, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. He speaks primarily to us. Because God knows that even under the teaching of the Bible and the preaching of the gospel, we can misunderstand. And so we need help and clarity continually from the Lord to guide us. But it's also possible that some of us here this morning don't claim to be Christians. And in that situation, I think it's even more important, perhaps, to listen carefully to what it is that the Lord has to say. 1 Peter 4 and verse 17 says this. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Christian is first. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Okay, so that's the picture. It's judgment, a judgment of mercy. God calling the people together and having this dry run. This is the real situation on the ground Make sure you understand it and respond to that accordingly. Then the psalm breaks into two sections. <clears throat> Verses 7 to 15 <coughs> talks about the imperfection of God's true people. And then verses 16 to 21 talks about the danger of God's false people. So we look at it in that order. Okay? So verses 7 to 15 the imperfection of God's true people. Now, the point he's making in verses 7 to 15 is there are people who really have entered into covenant with God by sacrifice. 
They really are God's people. But even though they really are God's people, they're not perfect, you know. And he's identifying that to them, and he's calling them to greater faithfulness. We all need that. In the latter section, he says there are people who are claiming to be God's people, but they aren't, you know. They aren't, you know. And they need to recognize that, and they need to come to God for mercy. All Christian people are imperfect. And they're imperfect as long as they live. I'm tempted to say show of hands for anyone who doesn't agree with that. That's pointless, isn't it? We know the truth of that, that all God's people are imperfect. Uh, John tells us about that in, in his first letter. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Thank God we've been redeemed and thank God we've been changed. But we won't be like the Lord Jesus Christ until we see him as he is. In this current world, there's still imperfection. But even though there's imperfection, we are the people of God. We are saved. We are people who desire to live for the Lord. We are on our way home to heaven. But we still have these failings and these imbalances. So notice what the Lord does here. Verse 7. He recognizes them as his people. Hear, O my people, and I'll speak. O Israel, I'll testify against you. I am God, your God. This is covenant language. You are my people, I am your God. Those are the great words of covenant all through scripture. You get it in Leviticus 26. I'll walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. A living relationship with the holy God. But they're imperfect. They were imperfect when he saved them, and they continue to be imperfect until he takes them home to glory. They were imperfect in Egypt when the Lord delivered them from slavery at the Passover. And Christian people were imperfect when the Lord Jesus Christ died for them. Romans 5. When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the, do you know the next word? Ungodly. It's remarkable, you see. Paul's making clear Christ died for the ungodly, not the good, not the triers. The ungodly, the failures. Not just the failures, but the ones who were deliberate in their opposition to God. Ungodly. Christ died for them. He recognized their imperfection and he wanted to deliver them. But that the idea is they don't become the people of God by obedience. They become the people of God by sacrifice. They've entered into covenant with me by sacrifice. Now in the Old Testament, you had loads of sacrifices. But what's made plain is that the blood of the sacrifices and the burnt offerings never really took away sin. It was just a picture. So in Hebrews 10 and verse 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It wasn't possible. That's why Christ came. Because they were pictures that was pointing to him, the true sacrifice. And even in the Old Testament, at the time of Asaph, they weren't saved through the animal sacrifices. They were saved through faith in the true sacrifice that was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. They were saved in the same way that Abraham was saved. And we read in, in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It wasn't what he did and what he offered to God. It was what God did for him that he trusted in. He believed God, who had promised that he would send one who would be the saviour of the world. He believed in him, and he was saved. Sacrifice. Now, in our day, in the New Testament, we know that this is gloriously fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given an unbreakable promise, a new covenant, as it's called, that he will save his people and will do everything that's necessary to save his people through the work of Jesus Christ, the great sacrificial lamb. All the pictures, all the types, all the sacrifices, the temple, all of that, it's all fallen away because Christ the fulfillment has come. I've said this before, but you know, you go away for the weekend and you take a fork of your family with you, don't you? And then when you come home, on Monday morning, you don't sit in the living room with them looking at the photo because the family's there. There's no need for a picture anymore because the reality has come. That's the way it was with the coming of Christ. 
all the pictures all fall away. But you see, they looked forward to the Christ that was to come in a promise. But we can look back to the Christ who has come and has made it all so gloriously plain. That's what happens. So the question comes, are we the people of God today? The ones who've entered into a living relationship with God by means of sacrifice. Have we come to trust in what God has done for us, not what we have done for him? And as a result of that, have we been brought to know the holy God? That's where it starts. God recognizes them as his people. But also, God identifies their failings. Hear, all my people, and I'll speak. O Israel, I'll testify against you. I am God, your God. Now, in the following verses, 7 to 15, what the Lord identifies is ritualism. They're offering a lot of sacrifices. Fine. But the danger was thinking that somehow their faithfulness, what they were offering, contributed something to God. There's a subtle danger there, which sometimes isn't so subtle at all. You notice, I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings. They are continually before me. But bear in mind, I won't take a bull from your house or goats from your fold, because every beast is mine. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I don't need your service. It doesn't add anything to me. It doesn't contribute at all. There's a subtle danger that what they are doing is falling into the situation where they think somehow God needs them and their service adds something. This is a perennial problem for real, true Christian people. In a crass, extreme form, you get it in the book of Galatians where the Christians were being told and were starting to believe that they, did, they needed more than God's appointed sacrifice, Jesus Christ. They needed other stuff like circumcision and keeping the law. No, no, says God. Nothing but Christ. Covenant with me by sacrifice. Nothing but Christ. Don't need that. If it gets to that extreme, it can become heresy. And there are branches of the Christian church that fall into this kind of trap. You know, The idea... I mean to be critical, but the idea in the Roman Catholic Mass, it's a representation of the sacrifice of Christ by a human priest. That's, that's, you, you can't represent the sacrifice of Christ. He offered it once for all and he sat down at the right hand of God. Nothing a priest can do for us can add to what Christ has done for us. It's already done and dusted. And we've got to watch, we don't fall into that trap by thinking that somehow our baptism does something or our prayer does something. Or our faithfulness does something. Dangerous. But there's a more subtle form. And the more subtle form is this. Thinking that somehow our service of God is kind of valuable in its own right. I can't think of a better way to put it than that. Valuable in its own right. So here's Asaph, he's warning the people. You go in and you're offering loads of sacrifices, he says. It's good. God has, you know, laid this down in Scripture. It's part of the pattern of the Old Testament. It's good to do that. But don't for a minute think that God needs it. Don't fall into that trap. Don't think that it's valuable in and of itself. Now, as Christian people, when we fall into that trap, what we do is we start to focus on our performance and focus on our faithfulness. And when that happens it starts to stand out like a sore thumb in these ways. It undermines assurance, right? How do I know that I'm a child of God? If it depends on my performance, my performance is never enough. So I can never really be sure. That's poison to the soul. Our assurance depends on the finished work of Christ for us. That's why we have a strong and solid foundation. Another thing he does is it makes us anxious. We are worried about ourselves. 
and what we are doing. It also makes us more formal. Our concern is to do the things. And it's difficult to stand back and recognise the spirit of it all, and what the Lord has done for us, the importance of love and caring for one another. It makes us critical of other people, particularly if we feel other people don't take my service seriously. And we don't like that. Because faithfulness is so important, isn't it? It bleeds away our thankfulness, is another symptom. Because rather than being thankful for the work that God has done in Christ, covenant by sacrifice, the danger is that it starts to fall on ourselves. We mustn't fall into the subtle trap of thinking that somehow our service of God is valuable. Because we warned against it in Luke chapter 17. Does he think, uh, sorry, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things that are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Don't fall into the trap. It's about what you do for God. However subtly, because it'll end up undermining your Christian life. Rather, verse 14, God calls us to faithfulness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Of course not. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving shows a heart which recognises that their salvation depends on God and not themselves. Thanksgiving means we've something to give God thanks for, not me. It's not the Pharisee praying in the temple, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week, blah, 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 blah. It's not that. It's that God be merciful to me, a sinner. And when he is merciful to me, a sinner, we thank him because the Lord has had mercy on us. Now, thanksgiving, as thanksgiving sacrifices, really, and vows, they were voluntary in the Old Testament. Voluntary. Why would you do that? Because you recognize you've got something to thank God for. You're not forced to do it. It's not required. This isn't something you can take off on a list, but there's something in your heart that says, I need to give thanks to God because of the great things he's done for me. Thanksgiving sacrifices flow from a heart response of thankfulness for grace and help that we get from God. And it seems to in the New Testament, Hebrews 13. Therefore, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share. With those sacrifices, God is well pleased. The right response to grace is what? Thankfulness. Can't pay back. Thankfulness. And the right response to love is what? Love him in return. And if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. So the Lord is saying, don't fall into the performance trap. Be careful of thinking you can add something to God. Don't do that. But recognize the reality of grace and show that in thankfulness. Because that's the real evidence that we understand that all of our salvation comes to us in Jesus Christ. Then the other thing, verse 15, God promises to bless them and make them useful. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Why? God is their God through Jesus Christ. God has done everything that's necessary for their salvation in Jesus Christ. Therefore, give thanks to God because he's done great things for you. But bear this in mind as well. The God that saved you through Jesus Christ is your God today, not just on the day he saved you. And he's committed to you every day in faithfulness to keep you and help you right until the very end. And it's all of grace. So when you're in trouble, don't think you have to give something to God to buy his favor. Call out to him and he will answer you because it's all of grace. You see what he's saying? You're in covenant with me by sacrifice. 
It's rooted in Jesus Christ. Well then, when you're in trouble, remember that God is faithful still and he's always ready to help you. Christian people have fellowship with a God that cares. And I think we need to make it kind of personal like that. A God that cares. 1 Peter 5, cast all your cares on him, not because he can do something about it. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. There's something very personal and real and compassionate about God in relationship with his people. So we can go to him, not like a slot machine, put the right prayer in, get the right answer. We can go to him like a father and recognize he cares for us and he knows better than we do what we need. So that's the summary of a true Christian life, you see. They're in fellowship with God by sacrifice. What does that mean? God has freely given Jesus Christ for us. By God's grace, we've come to trust in Jesus Christ by faith alone. And the result of that? Thankfulness. It's not about me, it's about him. So I'll give him thanks with my lips, and I'll give him thanks with my heart, and I'll give him thanks in my life. If he's died for me, I'll live for him who died for me. Because it's all about him. Now don't misunderstand. That's the point of the psalm. Don't misunderstand. God is showing us these things to help us live the Christian life aright. Don't fall into the trap. Make sure that your understanding of your relationship with God is so rooted in Jesus Christ's finished work that what it produces is not a desire to justify yourself, but a desire to give thanks to God. And a desire to live for him and to trust him and to know that he's your God every day. And even when you're in trouble, he'll step in and he'll help you. That's how we live the Christian life. Okay? The last thing, verses 16 to 21, that's the problem section. That's the dangerous bit. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth? Remember, they're all claiming to be God's people, aren't they? But God says, hold on, hold on. Those people are imperfect. They're imperfect, but they really trust me and they really love me. They need to tighten up a bit. They need to focus more on grace. They need to follow me from their hearts. Yeah, yeah. But these people, this is different. These people have no right to take my covenant in their mouth. No right to say that I am their God and that they are my people. No real right. These people are like they've joined a book club, you know? And notice like when you join the book club, you don't always go if you've got something more important to do. Well, that's what these people are like. It's not heart commitment that shows itself in their, in their lives. It's commitment with their mouths. But their hearts and their lives, they're all over the place. They don't know God. And the evidence of that is they're not thankful and they don't serve him from the heart. The Lord Jesus warns us about this in Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. By their fruits you know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, take my covenant in your mouth, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. My God, my people, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Their lives tell a different story. See, the test isn't their claims, it's not their words, it's their lives. 
and their lives show their true nature. Because like fruit on a tree, their lives flow from their heart. That's Psalm 50. They've got a profession of faith in verse 16. They take God's covenant in their mouth. They claim to be God's people. But they're not faithful ones, verse 5. They are wicked ones, disobedient. They've got a profession, but it's false. Their profession is empty. It's got no life in it. Now, make a couple of points from the passage here, and then I need to say something about this. Verses 17, 18, 19, and 20, right? Their profession's got no life. Verse 17, they're disobedient. They hate instruction and cast God's words behind them. They don't like what God says, so they disregard it. It isn't that they don't know, it's that they don't want to know. Now that's an important distinction, because it's different from a true believer. A believer hears the shepherd's voice and follows him. A believer says, what shall I do, Lord? Yeah? They say, I know what you want me to do, but I'm not doing that. They cast off God's word. Why? A believer loves the Lord Jesus Christ because he saved them, and because of that, he wants to follow him and please him. A false believer doesn't love Christ. Any obedience there is is forced because somebody else is watching. But the reality is, it isn't the love of Christ that controls them, it's love of self. So we won't have this man to reign over us. That's number one. Number two, they delight in sinfulness. Verse 18, thieves. When you saw a thief, you consented with him. What does that mean? They take stuff for themselves, okay? Then, they use others for their pleasure. Uh, he goes on to say, you've been a partaker with adulterers. Then, they put others down so that they can lift themselves up. In verses 19 and 20, it's evil speaking and lies and slander. You see, take stuff, use people, improve your own position by pushing other people down. What's going on there? Well, that kind of external living, it shows the desire of the heart. And there can be situations where we wouldn't have the guts to do it for fear of being found out. But we delight in thinking about it and reading about it and watching it. You notice in verse 18, is it? Verse 18, when you saw a thief, you consented with him. He's not pinching the stuff himself, but he thinks good on him. His heart is far away from the heart of God. That's where he takes his delight. And the reason? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now this is the important point to make, right? True Christians are not perfect. Well, these people aren't perfect either. What's the difference? The difference is this. Christians can fall into these things, but Christians don't live in them. David fell into adultery, didn't he? It wasn't the pattern of his life. You have examples in the New Testament. John Mark, who deserted um, Paul. But then later on, he came back. Peter, who denied the Lord, but he was restored. He wasn't a perpetual denier. He fell into it. But it wasn't the natural territory of his heart. There's a difference. But these people are not described as my people who are thankful. They're described as wicked ones who don't listen. There's no thankfulness in them because the tone of their life is a life which isn't under the lordship of Christ. Their life hasn't been coloured by thankfulness. They don't know him and live for him. He's never changed them. They can say what they like, but their lives speak more clearly. Now you get it in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now stop there. We were all unrighteous when the Lord saved us. So that's not what Paul is saying. 
When he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He goes on to say, don't be deceived. Neither, and then he gives a big list. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, where does that leave us then? Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He's saying, we are all like that, in one way or another. But you know what? When the Lord saved us, he changed us. He washed our hearts. He set us apart willingly to serve the Lord. And Christ became our Lord and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in our hearts. So although that was our character, it's not our settled character anymore. We might be tempted by things and there might be occasions when we fall into them. But it's not what we live for. We live for him who died for us. Now there are times in the Christian life when Christians go through periods of backsliding and coldness and hardness where it can be difficult to tell the difference. And Christians in that situation can start to think maybe, maybe there's never been anything real. I've become so cold and so hard. Maybe I'm just one of these wicked ones. I've got God's profession in my mouth, but my heart's far away. You normally find even then that a believer in that situation has a certain restlessness because they know that this isn't really them. They're not happy in the world, but they're embarrassed in the church. Why is that? Because the Lord's done something in the heart. They've entered into covenant with God by sacrifice. They know that Christ has done something for them. And even though they're living in the way they are, they can't shake it off. In the goodness of God, the Lord knows how to restore those and how to draw them back. But you see the point here? Don't be deceived. If somebody's life has not changed at all, and they are just as much of an idolater or a liar now that they ever were, and they've got no conscience about it, and the gospel's made no difference, why would they think the Lord has saved them? Why would they think the Lord has saved them? If God hasn't done anything for them, what kind of salvation is that? If he saved us to give us a home in heaven, and he's preparing us to go there, if he's delivered us from our sins so that we can live for Christ, well, that's salvation. But surely it makes a difference. It makes a difference in the way we live. What does it all come down to? Verse 21. These things you've done, well, I kept silent. Because you misunderstood, you see. You thought that I was altogether like you. And that's what shows that they don't know God. The holiness and the majesty and the glory and the mercy and the grace and the self-sacrificial love of God, it affects us when we know him. It challenges us. It shapes us. It pushes us. It draws us. We don't enter into the presence of God, the God that is, and stay the same. Think of Isaiah in chapter 6. Think of the Apostle John in Patmos, falling at his feet as one dead. Think of the Apostle Paul and his great desire that he might know him and be conformed to his death. It comes about because they saw God. They knew him. They'd entered into covenant with God. He'd become their God and they'd become his people. And they've got a desire to be like him. And God's very being challenges them. But these people, they still think that God's like us. He doesn't see. He doesn't care. He doesn't judge. So we carry on regardless. That's the big danger and the big warning sign. Right there. Where does all of this leave us? Well, it's a dry run. It's a dry run. God is coming and he's speaking to people and he's saying, Christian people, they trust me, 
They are washed with the blood of Christ. I know them. I'm their father. They are saved. But they're not perfect. Be careful you don't get off track. Live lives of thankfulness and faithfulness because I've saved you and you're mine. That's the call through the Christian life. Keep it simple. Live lives of thankfulness and faithfulness. Don't get too head up on the performance stuff. Just be concerned to serve, to serve him and to honour him and to love him and to praise him. That's the call. Make it all about him and make it less about us. He must increase and we must decrease. That's the call in the Christian life. Second call. If, however, you're in a position where... Despite your profession, your upbringing, your church attendance, you're still living for yourself. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because I haven't stepped in in judgment yet, I'm never going to. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that it doesn't matter. Verse 22. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. See, finally, the Lord steps in in everlasting judgment. But today, today it's different. Consider this, you who forget God. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I'll show the salvation of God. What you need to be is a worshipper, thankful. That's what God says, thankful. Why would I thank God? You need to realise what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for sinners. And you need to trust him for yourself. That'll make you thankful. Your life needs to be different. What does that mean? You need to be a disciple. You need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has won your heart. The call of the gospel is always a call away from sin to righteousness. But it's more personal than that. It's a call away from me to him. That's always the issue. Away from me to him. When I confess sin, I confess this is me, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what I've done. When I repent of sin, I say I've got a problem in myself and I can't trust myself and I've made mistakes. Lord, I need you to step in and do something about that. I need you to forgive. I need you to change. I need you to keep. I need you to help. Lord, I need you to be my saviour. It's turning away from me to him. And when he does it, what greater reason could there be in the whole universe, in the whole of time, to give thanks to God other than the fact that he heard my cry and lifted me up out of a miry pit and set my feet upon a rock? That's what it is, isn't it? So we've reason to be thankful. And we've reason to trust and to follow. We've entered into covenant with God by sacrifice. Christ has done it all. So my life is filled with thankfulness for him that bore my pain. And I'll follow the Saviour. Let's pray. Father, we recognise this morning that sometimes we don't know ourselves very well. So we pray in mercy that you'd help us to understand. We pray, Lord, that you'd do that in such a way that the devil wouldn't get a foothold and drive some of us to become hard or some of us to be despairing. But that instead of that, your spirit might give light. And that through it all, we might see Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shining in glory and calling us simply to come and trust him. Have mercy, Father. How we thank you that you speak to us clearly today. Because today is a day of salvation. Hear us, we pray. In the Saviour's name. Amen.